So, um, let's go back a little to the Greek Hellenistic uh, life of, um, I was saying that Arete, uh, I've been reminded by it, to put a post to Ubris, uh, it's the righteousness, and in the, in the journey to wisdom, uh, in Greece you have to make uh, act and uses of arete and control the appetites, the uris. But uh, in this case, you can very well see through the Neoplatonician to the, to the uh, Christianity uh, how the, this survey of the appetites has a, uh, how the length that, that it has taken. But there is another uh, current that uh, it's the uh, Dionysian uh, <coughs> current and the, 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 ra the rapture of, of the, um, the, the wisdom, wisdom as a rapture. That is, uh, Socrates, uh, for example, in the Banquet, he, he talks about his <coughs> diamond and uh, even his, uh, I would say, his feminine side, uh, because here the, the genders are mixed in the sense that the, the, the hero or the philosopher is, can be raptured by wisdom, and his dreams and his mania then becomes, the hubris the becomes the mania of, of, of the wisdom itself. I mean, where in the one hand you have to oppose appetite by the righteousness of your conduct, in another hand, to really reach the, this, this um, capacity of the soul to look at the truth, uh, you have to be able to let yourself, let yourself rapture. And it's a whole, it's, it's, it's quite intriguing when you go back to the text, either to uh, Homeric or, or uh, tragedies or, um, of course, philosophical texts, that there is always this other path, this, this, uh, this leading path that uh, is very connected to the East, also uh, that is, uh, making a sign to us. Um, of the, the receptivity of the soul and that the, the wisdom comes by um, uh, as a, as a, on the soul and, and takes it to, to the place of, of light. Or, uh, but it, it's, there is a risk of dismantlement. Huh? The, the, um, uh, and in, on this side, uh, the, the, the body, the, the, the sex has been also perceived as furor and rapture. Um, uh, the Dionysian dimension of old passion traversed the civilization of, of ancient Greece from the earliest beginning uh, of its mythological corpus. As you know, the figures of Dionysus and the Bacchanalia crystallizes the entire set of orgastic motif. The collective fury at the carrying away of the bodies and their furious dismemberment, the reign of what is too close, blended, confused, generation, the dead and li the living, the animal and the human, the sac sacred and the profane. That's a trespassing world. I mean, where uh, all the, these gates we were talking about yesterday are open, and on the Dion Dion Dionysiac uh, reign, um, that Nietzsche also would, would interpret, uh, interpretate. Um, there, there's no such uh, <coughs> thresholds that can uh, protect you from the, the, this this mixing, for example, of the, the sacred and the profane, or the living and the dead. The god Dionysos explodes all notion of identity with the self. He flees by transforming himself. He's a, he appears under m multiple masks. And uh, this themselves over um, and carries along with him in his madness the cortege of the Bacchante, who give themselves over to carnage and orgies. His identity is multiple in his very body, huh? part demon, part man, part god. He's pushed by the goddess Hera, who wants to uh, put him to death because he subverts the order of the living and the dead. 
thus also that of memory. He inhabits the tragic dimension par excellence. Through the figure of the god Pan and other avatars, we see Dionysian sexuality displayed on all stages as a device for knowing and overturning identity, but also as a scale towards wisdom. That's the you can never put it on only a black or shadowing side. Um, uh, Dionysus is excess disproportion, uh, carnavalesque, we would say, on the, on, the, on the medieval world. In the face of the ideal, this extravagance maintains the reality of the erotic body, the desiring body as the sole measure of the different and radical truth that stands as an obstacle to the separation between death and life, memory and future, representation and will, because it's also um, uh, the god presiding to the theater. Huh? That, uh, that. And in, in his er heretical essays, I was talking yesterday about uh, this philosopher Patoshka, reminds us that the myth of Plato's cave is a reversal of traditional mystery and uh, mysteries and their orgiastic cults. Those cults already aimed, if not a fusion, then at least a confrontation of the responsible part of us and the orgiastic. The cave is a remnant of the subterranean gathering place of the mysteries. It is the womb of Earth Mother. Plato's novel idea uh, is the will to leave the womb of the Earth Mother and to follow the pure path of light, in a sense. The Dionysian dimension is par excellence, and that, that why it compels also the philosopher, that of, of metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. Uh, which liberates the possibility of the exceptional. So, the, the, it's interesting to see that the, the path of the arrêté is the path of the, the, the man measured with his own excellency. But the path of the excep exceptionality uh, has to confront itself to this orgastic Dionysic part. Um, uh, there is a, um, uh, a very beautiful uh, quote of Patoshka, I will read you here. It says, when we are in the exceptional mode, as opposed to the everyday, he writes, we are enraptured, something more powerful than our free will. Um, uh, Something more powerful than our free possibility or responsibility seems to break into our life and bestow on it meaning which it would not otherwise know. Here we are not escaping from ourselves, but rather we are surprised by something, taken aback, captivated by it, and that something does not belong among things and in the ordinary day in which we can lose ourselves among the things that preoccupy us. Here we experience the world not only as the region of what is in our power, but also as what opens itself up to us of itself and as experience, for instance, of the erotic, of the sexual, of the demonic, of the dread, of the holy, is then capable of penetrating and transforming our life. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, I think it, it beautifully takes account for this uh, two-sided uh, Hellenic vision that cannot be only, uh, as sometimes it has been, uh, re-read by the, through the uh, Christianity scope, uh, only as a, a sustaining the, the, the appetites, because there is a, this whole uh, diamond uh, way to wisdom that includes um, maybe not the body as a self. That's the. It's not. It's the the, the din, It's it's body. It's a body dismembered. So 
it's, it's a real question whether it's our body we, or it's a rupture of bodies. So it's the, it calls on into more the ecstatic, um, what will be after um, uh, continued in, in the a whole mystical, uh, even in Catholicism side of the, the Thérèse d'Avila, Saint Jean de la Croix, the, the, the mystical side of the body that's raptured. Um, but, but definitely it includes a, 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 the thought of the body nevertheless. Yeah? It's not... Um, in, in, in this sense, um, uh, alors, what is the, the... What happened with Christianity is that the, the figure of Christ brought the body and flesh back in the heart of his philosophical thought, whether you want it or not a body of thought from which he had been exiled, at least for a time, as, as such, as the self, as I was saying that. Yeah. And from Augustine to Hegel's metaphysics found itself charged with the crushing responsibility of justifying the existence of a mortal God, mortal like any human. That's the real scandal, at least in an analytic point of view. And, and even a Latin one, pre-Christian, uh, that it can be uh, mortal. The structure of the Catholic corpus was put into place around the fourth century, when the Constantine converted to Christianity, uh, especially with the rejection of the heresies. Saint Augustine occupies an inaugural place in this post-Pauline second Christianity in which little by little flesh and the body gradually took on a negative value that la later, later extends to everything that has anything to do with desire. It's true that uh, I have to, to, be, to, to be true to, to the paradox yet yeah, that even if what we are have in re what we have we are the, the the hostage and the heirs and the inheritors of a tradition that has really negativized the body and desire. Uh, it, it can't be said that you can, no matter how you twist it, the, 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 the Christianity has been a disaster in that sense. But it is true also that <clears throat> when you read Augustine, for example, and we, you read the Paulinian text, uh, it's amazing to, to see that, and Dostoevsky has, has come up on that too, for example, that the scandal of the, the, the body, that the Christ is a body, is quite a beautifully taken of in the Evangile. It's not, that's why it's, it, and, and, and it's, it's a true question, it's a very beautiful one. It, it, one can't say that as, as the beginning in the text, uh, it, it was... Uh, uh, a rejection of the body, it's not true. It, they refuse the gnosis. The gnosis, the, the, the temptation of the gnosis was to put the whole body under the rule of evil and the, the pure thought, soul, and light and, and the rule of God, but Christianity didn't want the gnosis. So we have to be very precautionate here in. Um, uh, in not letting the, the, the heritage, uh, very uh, difficult and, and, and by many ways, um, by some ways very negative of this, the history of the body through uh, Christianity to, um, to blindfold us from the, the much more rich um, evidence and proposition of what's the carnal body uh, in the, the, the lecture of Christianity itself. So this, this is, I mean, we have, as soon as history and time is involved, we have this, always this both lecture of, of what's the heritage and what is the, the, the beginning of the proposition. Hmm? Hmm. Um, during Christianity's first 10th century, all possibilities for spiritualing errors collapsed, in a sense, except in the figure of monastic renunciation or sainthood. Only with courtly love do we see resurgent codes governing spiritualized combat and amorous encounters in which the joy of love is associated with a spiritual quest. 
but joy is also ravishment, rapture. Uh, you could the, the, the troubadour could dwell in, in the lady's love at a price. Revishment took the form of song, poetry, memory, and no sexual intercourse, usually, or at his life's price. Uh, the Christian denial of the body is not a disdain for the body, not even a rejection. It's the awareness that nothing can save us from the human condition, um, and that being born of flesh afflicts us with an original depth to evil, abandonment, pain, betrayal, for which we have to answer. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that Freud is not so far from <laughs> having that reading in a complete other uh, agnostic way, that he thinks we are very much indebted as soon as we are in this world. It may be uh, definitely not with evil, but with abandonment, for example, and, and pain, uh, yes. Each one of us, in other words, in so much as we are human beings, beings delivered up to humanity is affected by the question of evil or general sin before any other act, before any speech, any intention. Uh, it's the question of shame that arises here, really uh, linked to the body of uh, desire. Uh, and the shame is, uh, uh, is a way of indicating that this uh, uh, way we are indebted to the body uh, is not redeemable. Nothing can um, break this predicament breaks this um, um, unshadowing uh, our path uh, and that the shame is something we have to respond of uh, no matter how um, just we are in our lives. And in a way, the Lutherian uh, pact uh, will, I think, take act of this and with the theory of the grass and that the who save or not, uh, sort of says, okay, we're on into shame, all of us, and we're not going to to um, look at who's worth what for what. Just, um, because, of course, from this shame, uh, uh, or not to call it the original sin, but, you know, that's what uh, I call, I prefer to call it shame because I think original sin is completely lost for us. Uh, fortunately, but shame isn't. And sometimes when uh, it happens, for example, for me with my patients, it sometimes arises as a, almost like a pure idea, like, like something completely over sur sur superseding and remote to any event of the life of the patient, something that we have to, to cope and think with, and no matter how is our denial or our trying to um, um, put in face to this shame a history, an event, you know, what happened, it, it doesn't work. We have to deal with it in another way, I think, sometimes, that the shame of what would be, what, what can it be a shame of being alive in this body and how can we relate to this tradition from Greece to Christianity to think this in another way, to, to, to uh, uh, overpass the guiltiness, but think with it and not against it. Because if we only think against it, then we're not supposed to be ashamed, and so there ends the, the cure of the thinking. Uh, and I think that sometimes the, the, the problem with, with modernity is that we are like happy child, you know, be, be, having set free from all this shit and, and uh, why is it still calling upon us? Why, why um, it's like the haunted house, why is it still a, a creeping phantom com, coming around, you know, how can we, uh, if, if we don't recognize the presence or the reminiscence, then, then uh, well, well, it's going to 
creeping uh, around all the time. And, uh, uh, shame raises the question of transgression and taboo, mm -hmm. what has established the need to posit a moral prohibition. It is transgression that has called for the taboo on murder and incest, or is it from the starting point of the reality of evil that the moral prohibition, as we know it in the West, has been constructed? That's a <coughs> again a little. Uh, I was discussing with a psychoanalyst that's also that comes from a family of rabbi and, and is very versed into our Hebraic tradition, and we were. He was. I was interviewing him into a. Um, Interpret his interpretation prof profane uh, of the Ten Commandments uh, in terms of psychoanalytic uh, clinic. And it's interesting that at one point he said, do you remark, and I hadn't thought about it really, that incest is not one of, in one of the Tenth Commandments. How come? I mean, it's... What is it? The, the, the forbidding incest? Mm -hmm. is is not in the Ten Commandments. I mean, it should be in the first or the third, of, uh, you know, it's <laughs> the principle of the, uh, and definitely it's, it's on the Hebrew traditions to, to the forbidden. So you say, well, because it's not uh, forbidden, it's a taboo. The, uh, as one, as uh, once as you put a forbidding act, like the Ten Commandments, they command and they forbid, forbade you, uh, you uh, mm, you ask you call for the transgression. Uh, it, it's, uh, we don't have to wait for it to know that. So the taboo is not calling for the transgression, and it should even be unthought of. Mm -hmm. It is interesting because I had never thought of it. Um, I'm just going back to the point we were speaking about shame in terms of um, in terms of Christianity. It's uh, Shame comes as a way of indicating our, our indebtedness to the body. I'm thinking about um, in terms of Eastern philosophy, where death is looked at differently. Does that, by extension, change the relation to shame? Like, how does shame figure there? Yes, uh, uh, it changes considerably. I was telling a student that, unfortunately, I'm very, very interested in Eastern thinking, but I don't feel. I'm, I'm definitely not masterizing this time again, but not even the vocabulary. The, so if I'm not talking a lot about it, it's not out of curiosity or even of you know, being uh, driven to it. It's just out of humility. And I, so this is um, but definitely, I think it's completely another uh, shame, as, as I put it here, is, is not uh, relevant. I mean, I, would, I can't speak to it entirely, but it changes definitely. It's, uh, it's something different mm. in the East, for sure. And I guess it was interesting it, it probably is so because of that, the different nature of our relation to, to death and to body. Yes, of course. And, and, uh, and also, the, yeah? Well, I was just going to add to that. Um, I, I think that there's uh, some uh, overlap related to kind of Puritanism, Puritanism and religion in terms of uh, relationship to guilt. You know, you can tie in um, Puritan movements of whatever religion uh, that tie into, I think, Eastern uh, religion, but I think the relationship of particular Eastern uh, religions to uh, reincarnation and those aspects uh, certainly impact. Um, I I would relate shame to, to my vision of East so that is again hmm, uh, in relation to uh, conducts and e events uh, and uh, uh, and not to the fact that we are incarnated in a mortal body uh, because first we are going to. Uh, encounter body again in another life, but also because 
it is not um, the, the the body is the instrument of the, the the wisdom as a whole. It's not something we have to cope with or to support or to to uh, uh, the the. And really, it's interesting because in, in the in the um, in the West, but most of them, Christianity, there is really something about sexuality as such. It's not only the body, because um, and and it's also interesting that, for example, in, in the if you read the Evangile, there, there's n there's no shame put on you know the the, the prostitute event, and th there's no shame directly put on the body, not even on the sexuality. But there is something, I think, so mm, at least that's my lecture, so radical in the um, <coughs> in what the the movement of of, of the calling of the Christ unto the people that is quit your family, quit your belonging to uh, again the Abrahamic call, you know, uh, put everything and go towards an, a new life. That um, in a way the the church has had to turn it all the way around to all to 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 deny this over and over again to put the family as the pilier. Uh, it's, it's amazing because it did exactly reverse if you if you think about it it put the family into this well leaving you know the monastic some spaces you know that could but uh, the, the chastity for the priest and stuff but but really ruling putting an, an, an an amazing ruling of the the family code up to the Hegelian code and Napoleon and Hegel, it's like the, the, the end of this family scope. Um, and it's quite amazing, it's, it's, it's like really trying to um, put a veil on this potential, amazing, um, disruptive of all order that would be the Evangile. And I, I think the, the Grand Inquisitor de Dostoevsky is really a, an amazing text on that point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, um, in the Frère Karamazov, oh, oh. remember the Grand Inquisitor, he, he imagines the Inquisitor, the God coming back, and the Grand Inquisitor re goes to the cell, the, 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 the prison where he is, and uh, says, you know, how come they put you to jail again, you know, we are waiting for you, you've been waiting for, you know, your return, and Christ says, you know, but no, no matter, and the Le Grand Inquisitor says, you know, we're not going to to let you uh, do do your revolution again. We put all this time to you know <laughs> put it to order. Now you're not going to put everything again upside down. So it's it's a very interesting lecture uh, of, of this potentially uh, very polemic and, and in a way progressive. Uh, way to exchange. So um, sexuality to the extent that it signified excess, the non-humanized brought back into view with the characteristic of animal bestiality, that which escaped all sociality, animality as thus became that which cast out outbounds of the civilized sphere, the human compact, the police. Huh? Uh, in this struggle against the bestial, I would say, philosophy appears uh, as the point of ultimate recognition of the essential spirituality of our being, as I would uh, um, say. Uh, but um, <coughs> we know uh, that there is no uh, soul, no memory that signal towards the spiritual origin of humanity the breach is open continuously, continuously for inhumanity to be engulfed. Uh, uh, if humanity has pulled itself above inhumanity, that's less than sure, the whole perspective is overturned and it is not so much excess that needs to be regulated, for example in sto stoic mor morality, but all the appetites uh, which then becomes the stigma of a nature that was distorted from the start. Um, 
So, um, uh, I would say that um, The, the, um, the relation to, to the essence, the essential in philosophy, is something that has uh, bypassed or accompanied the, the later Christian uh, seeking for um, the, the, the path of the faith, I would say. The, they mingled uh, in their own way. Uh, as you know, in the Middle Ages, the Greeks were reinterpreted through, mostly through the uh, Avicenne, Averroes, uh, the, the uh, philosopher of, um, what did you call them, and, and not, not the Middle East, uh, uh, Hebraic, the first Islamic Hebraic, uh, Islamic uh, thinkers and that they have uh, and Bo Boes too Boes was a very important uh, who, who wrote the Consolation of Philosophy in the 5th the, the century the, the one of the first post-Stoic uh, thinkers that linked Christianity to um, the, especially Aristote who, who reprinted and, and um, uh, and then there was Averroes uh, and Avicenne. And so in this mingling, there, there was a sort of reinterpretation of this path, this path towards essence, usia, and the being, and the path towards uh, the, the light of God, as uh, Saint, Saint Thomas, especially, uh, would. Um, uh, would represent it. Again, we shouldn't have a vision of the Middle Ages too easy, because what we call the disputatio in uh, medieval ages were really fights. I mean, fights in the sense that nothing was, um, uh, there was nothing such as we figure it sometimes as a decree that would uh, overcome the thought of God or the thought of what is wisdom. It was really disputed uh, in a very radical way. And when you go on to the uh, Abelard's Chronicle or even the uh, Albert Le Grand, and at that time, I'm not going to, to push into that too much, but it's amazing to see in, in when I went to medieval studies in La Sorbonne, most of the images I had of this you know, t tranquil path, just in between, sort of a sort of spongy and, and, and a shadowy time of, of being in between the Hellenic and the Enlightenment is completely false. And they have um, brought to light some of the most important paradoxes and uh, things we are still on now, uh, the, the nominalist and, and uh, fight, for example, but also what is being, what is beauty, what is unity, in a, you would be amazed at the, the, the length towards the push, the, 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 the disputation, and uh, what is said about desire, about appetites, the way they try to <coughs> save them and, and put them back into the path towards God, but, but at the same time take account on uh, what it is to desire. I wouldn't push it as long as to say it's pre Freudian, but um, at least it's much wider than what we imagine. And I think that the, the, it's not um, has a, a chance that um, the, what I said was the troubadour, the joy, all this, this um, love, uh, heritage and especially in the poetry that is and the, the grand quest all, all this poetry is uh, um, amazingly uh, accurate on the uh, notions of passions that is it's as if once you would have said okay we all belong to God we are 
it's the only path there. Now we can talk about what's important. And then you have a whole corpus that's amazingly free, almost more free. You have to wait, I think, almost till the 18th century to find this freedom in the texts again. If you read the, even Chrétien de Troyes, Marguerite de Navarre, and that's for the French, uh, but uh, you find in this, in this very, very early poetry an amazing rawness, uh, a way to say the body with all its, its uh, affections, afflictions, amazingly, uh, really uh, free. And uh, it's almost like if censorship of the, the of the, the Christianity uh, church had allowed, once you sort of give the, the bypass, you know, I mean, uh, could allow you to explore uh, a very, uh, an amazing extent that, that, um, that dream of desire. But it had to be poetry. It's, it's like the, the Lear, Lear had to be crazy. No, it had to be poetry. It had to be, a, uh, of course, it wouldn't be, it, it, it could become alleged as a discourse of, um, of the power, as it will be in 17th and 18th century. Well, it will be brought to the court. It, could, it couldn't be, but it could be under, undermine undermine and underlying discourse, a very intense one, and I think um, maybe in the modernity, I would say that many, uh, for example, you can really drive a line from Villon to Rimbaud, from, from uh, Marguerite de Navarre to Apollinaire, I mean there's a link there that's very strong and that uh, almost bypasses the enlightenment. In a way. So I have a question for you. The way what you're saying um, is <coughs> with the, the the kind of Christian tendency, I would say, toward um, a denial of the body. There's a kind of sublimation that happens, which then therefore is channeled into art. Is it is that mm -hmm. kind of in a way the sort of like in a way you could say that the the or the origins of some great art in in the Occident or in uh, global north now, we could say comes from this tradition of sublimation. Is Definitely, the, the, the what what has allows us uh, um, Christianity is the sublimation of, of into picture and into uh, the arts of the passions. But I would say that um, in the mid in the early Middle Ages. Um, all this tradition of poetry and of, of worship, it's worship and poetry and, and troubadour and chevaldry, uh, the same spot, is not exactly sublimation because, well, it is in a Freudian sense, but it is not in a political sense. How could I put it? Politically, the sublimation of the, the, the passions and, the, and, the, and what is a body has to wait for the Baroque the post-enlightenment baroque, because there it's invited to, you know, you can draw a, a curved line and it's interesting, it's, it's, to put it very quickly. Mm -hmm. At that time, no, you, you, could, you couldn't sublime a, a, a passion and say in, it's interesting as sublimated. You, you would, there's no perspective yet. <coughs> I mean, you, did, you know, you have to represent, if you represent the Virgin, it's the Virgin and the angels and in a certain order. That's still a very cosmical order. But it's more, at that time, and I'm really speaking 10th, 11th, 12th century, so very early, you could, um, you could say, I'm Christian and I give you all the evidence of it. Now, I turn to my courtyard in the castle and let's play and sing. But that's not to be overheard. Mm -hmm. But we can have the texts and we can bring into the chivalry uh, encounters. And, but it's not to be, um, it's not a, an authorized version. You see, it, it's not, uh, um, c est, c est pas it's not forbidden also. It's a sort of, that's why I say it's a sort of, a, of an in-between marginal space 
that engulfed an amazing uh, uh, freedom. That, that's, it, it's very interesting, your, your question, because maybe that's why it's so crude and, and uh, even sexually, it's so crude and it's so, in a way, um, true and, and, and uh, amazing on the description of passion. Because if it was, the problem of sublimation is sublimation has to give tribute to the censor censorship somehow. It's not complete sublimation because that's the whole deal with uh, right. mm, the surmoi. Okay. It's it's more of a I don't know a, a sort of a other path that tolerated. And also from what I understand, the the, the troubadours or the romanceros in Spain, um, weren't they also sort of Jewish, Christian, and Islamic? Like all these traditions are kind of really hybridizing. Yes. Um, to create these expressions. <coughs> Lots of them were Mahans that uh, underlied, I mean, maintain the tradition of Hebraic on a secret. Yeah. Yes. Mm. There's a so a whole tradition of secrecy here that's very in interesting and that. Uh, I mean, I remember in the Indonesia monasteries, exactly this time, this when the world was being fragmented and everyone's kind of making their own interpretation mm. around, and it's exactly the interpretation is also more of, of um, it's from where the missions come out, that they can come out, and so there's a, a certain role also of the, um, of the appeal <laughs> that mm. has to be created in the form of song or some kind of artistic expression that actually rounds up of going out uh, and representing something to others. At the same time, in the monastery where they used to not find they could they mark the prayers and it's like kind of big families that like the marking of the prayers, the marking of a series of routines that maintain mm. you know, an order on chaos somehow or in that limit. And then the mode of propagation is these kind of vectors that come out, but they're always uh, interpretative and they actually communicate those events better than Disputatio is superhero, right? Well, what's interesting is that the Disputatio time is before the, re the, the, ru the real ruling of university. Yes. And something was lost there. Mm -hmm. Because in the Disputatio, maybe because, again, as the poetry, it was a field where you said, we're both Christian, no problem. So then we could dispute in a way that if you hadn't said, here I'm Christian, you would have gone to fire at the two minutes after because they really went very far into maybe, for example, the, the bear clay after mm, against Kant, the, you know, maybe this world doesn't exist and we all, that, it all came up. It, it, very, it pushed very far. Maybe we were all, we're all an illusion out of, a, you know, a, a, a Neville mind or, this is a little story, but, you know, it pushed very far. And, and the disputatio were somehow not exactly forbidden, but it's as as it, with the first Sorbonne and and, and other and many others, the the, the, the Spanish first installation of, of real seminars of, and and where you couldn't anymore go that far, because maybe they saw what was what could be really provocative of, of a Nordo. What, for example. The, as, as it um, comes into sex, sexuality, the, the famous Abelard and Eloise uh, problem uh, was not so much about uh, having sexual affair with, with her pupil, with Eloise, and they both went very far in that, uh, somehow with the letters we know in that, uh, uh, well, they had, they had a, a child, but it was because he was censured by, I mean, he was on the tutorship, and, and there was a whole uh, disputation with Albert Le Grand and everything. And it's more, it's not only the, the, the Eloise uh, case that uh, came with his castigation, it was also what he brought up as a, as a thinker. It was really. Um, because theology, theology at the time was really making a split, or at least practicing this split again with philosophy, right? I mean, it was long like this uh, theology that, uh, like, right, just before this, uh, um, and disciplines start to see this into the light, the theology was used for a lot of things, 
but at the same time, the world it wasn't needs split to already. Yeah. It wasn't split. No, no, it was split with science. Mm -hmm. It was really the same. Uh, it, it was into disciplines, but the, the main tree wasn't uh, uh, torn about yet. It was really the unity of being that was uh, seeked. Um, yes. I was just going to add something. During this uh, time period that you speak of, you're preceding uh, a conception of a nation state uh, in this concept. Because of that very consolidation, it was, I think, a way of um, perpetuating a culture to kind of propagandize a way of, of, of being in society. So I think it, 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 it um, fit the very kind of pragmatic role of promoting a sense of public order on a specific paradigm. And I think the second kind of pragmatic cultural aspect of it would be in child development and child rearing. So in the sense of like, you know, the Catholic notion of guilt and that the child is being raised and they steal something, you, you invoke that sense of guilt and each, you know, cultural religion has this sense of this type of development. So you have a socialized being as they come forward and that, you know, that, that went on for centuries and still goes on. Absolutely. Mm. And, it's, and it's true too that the question of, of we, we haven't time to go over to all the notions, but the, the, the way childhood is taken account of is very important. We could really uh, drive a, a link in, in uh, that uh, um, the way uh, you could. I mean, thinking the childhood as we think it is very, very, uh, very few years. It has been uh, uh, really relegated to the, the, the uh, the notion of um, <coughs> what is a, what is a, at stake for a society to in order to um, uh, create the best possible citizen and the best possible mind for it. Uh, the idea that um, a child could have a, a vision or an, an, a principle of its own that it's not, it's, it's amazingly um, um, not uh, there until uh, maybe uh, the post uh, Second War. So uh, it, it's it's interesting to, to look back at it. Uh, sometimes I, I, I used to ask the, the students uh, what was the, uh, what's the crime, the highest crime for, for you? And some come up with the child, you know, go, uh, child crime. And, um, or, or otherwise just, you know, crime against a, a person and the murder. And it's interesting to see that uh, up to uh, very recently, uh, the, the parricide, uh, at least in the French uh, uh, Napoleonian code, but that was for many European countries, was uh, the biggest crime. And after you had all the, I mean, if you murdered the father, it was more, much worse than all the other murders. What, there was the king first, and then the father, mm -hmm. and then all the other murders. And that lasted uh, up to, in the French text, up to 57, 1957. And that the, also on the Napoleonian code, the, the, it's written like this, on, it's, the, it's come from the Roman code. The father has a right to death and and, and, and life over his children. So law cannot enter the father's uh, despotic rule. And it, it's interesting to, to see that when they switch it, um, first they made a move in two times in, in the French constitution. First that was to say the Paris seat is not anymore a crime above all the other crimes. It's all the crimes of the same uh, level and then they put crime against humanity, but that was quite mm -hmm. recent too, it's like, you know, maybe 50 years ago. Um, up, 
So perceiving the others. In relation to ideas of shame, I wanted to just share maybe a different kind of perspective um, regarding this notion of like querying Christian and or Eastern like modalities of experiencing shame. Um, and this isn't really at all fleshed out. It's kind of more of a husk, but it, I mean, I think that's a very problematic and notion that would have to be approached very tentatively. Um, because to my mind, uh, whenever there's a notion of social conduct um, or a relation to normative modes of engaging in social relationship and sexual relationship in any culture, like the specter of shame <coughs> exists there. Uh, my, you know, information about shame uh, kind of comes from ideas of non-normative sexual identity uh, and like queer theory or histories of gender theory in this way, where it's even when we speak about the Greek or Athenian tradition, like terminology of homosexuality and heterosexuality isn't exactly mm -hmm. accurate because this terminology didn't exist until mm -hmm. much, much later. Um, but what has always kind of interested me and might seem like another way to move into this question is regarding um, something like shame as like an objectless shame that uh, would appear as an apparition anywhere, regardless of uh, kind of metaphysical beliefs about the body, insofar as it's possible to have uh, non-normative desire, you know. Um, and I, I think that it just, to, to want to conceptualize, like, shameless otherness or, like, shameless Eastern conceptions, well, I yeah, I mean, I, and I, know, I know that's not what... No, I think What's interesting, I was just trying to understand that the relate shame in sort of the Christian world is being related to our relationship to our indebtedness to body of death. Mm -hmm. And so how does that change shame in mm -hmm. cultures where they don't view that in the same way? It does. Mm -hmm. I mean, shame is, is systemic and it's, it's everywhere. But what is could be interesting is to see what where shame generates from mm -hmm. when there's a different relationship to death if we're following that um, if we're following that line of thought mm -hmm. that shame is related to our indebtedness to the body which is ultimately um, you know fallible and, and mm -hmm. so I think it's a really interesting question about shame yeah. where do we locate it yeah. but the thing is the sh shame also is uh it's not only about death, it's really about you. Uh, uh, we don't want to know nothing about the place of our desire. Mm -hmm. So shame is interrelation, uh, interrelationing to the, the censorship of the common um, social uh, space. But also, and that what I see today that is quite difficult, is that shame as the inscription of we shouldn't be desiring that way, so we, um, without the, the help of any s outside censorship, we, um, we, we unveil, we, we are constantly uh, thinking where we are not, and having that shame instead of relating the, to this hunger or to this desire, as, a, uh, because the drive, is still seen as something so dangerous that it could disrupt the self, mm -hmm. and it's it's because I see today, for example, where I would say that it's the the for example the censorship of a society saying no sex before marriage and you shouldn't see this and that you know that worked let's say up to the maybe sixties. Uh, to, to do it very roughly, that has turned complete side to side to you should be uh, knowing the Kama Sutra by heart at 20 or you're nothing. And I found the same completely uh, 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 anguished young um, uh, woman saying, 
you know, I pretend, but I'm terrified. So what can I do? The censorship goes, still goes on. The, only it has changed, you know, it's not the same, of course, and I'm not saying we have to go back, definitely not. But, but it, it opposes the self still so much that you see that the history of the shame goes beyond. Mm -hmm. well, Along the lines of the, I mean, this thinking of, you know, Christ as the embodiment mm -hmm. um, of the divine or God, and then creating the potential for for intimacy, like that's the representation of the push for int intimacy or entanglement. I mean, if you have a body, then you there is an inadequacy there that is only really met by sort of interaction, I guess, with the other, and and the inability to move beyond that, or the perceived inability to move beyond that, but I feel like, um, but I know just a little bit about Rumi, the poet, and his concept of our sexuality and a, as a direct link to spirituality, and mm -hmm. that this, you know, there's a, there's a joy in that connection beyond the shame, and the point being that um, that's an entree into so if people just stop at at the the threshold of um, of this uh, of this entree into what a relation like a relationship you can have with the the world at large rather than mm -hmm. containing it to this possessive place mm -hmm. um, then that to me is a way a really interesting way of viewing like what it is you're doing in that divine moment and, and, and the incredible sort of opening of that of that moment like what we're supposed to do with it so. but that oh. is a direct path to freedom and yeah. that's, that's you know society is very very problematic to social freedom is very problematic <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I mean it's a real freedom path yeah. Is this path of, that links? Uh, so I was trying to that links philosophy to sexuality to to the to a, a, a path of emancipation, but of, of um, real emancipation, not not uh, not break, not so much as breaking free from, but as uh, conjecting or entering the place where it comes the freedom as itself. It's not some, something any society will, will, will agree on because, um, and I'm not here saying, you know, the horrible capitalistic eye on us, and, no, not any of that sort, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a logic of being that's radically against the logic of, of having and of objects and of need and of desire. That's why even working I found, for example, that when I talked with um, psychiatric of hospitals, what I was saying to when when you work with the hunger of an anorexic, when when you say you know just look at it as you can love it, you can go beyond, and and it's they don't like it at all. They just. <laughs> don't give you credit for it. yeah, if it's, it's saved, it. if the yeah. person is saved and really was going to die, then it's okay, you know, but, you know it's by chance. But it, it's something that there you can see that, and it's not one person making the censorship. It's not, it's, it's not, I, I can't, I, I mean, I, I, I don't have this, this paranoid uh, idea that you know, there's nothing as a censor going around. But it's a, it's, the need of the object to come confronting our hunger and, and to, to put it back into order is so overdriving us mm -hmm. that when you want to do the reverse motion of letting, you, <coughs> letting the subject free of, the, of its object, which is really the philosophical path to me, um, but that can be paradoxically also a sexual uh, way of, uh, meeting the, the, the uh, otherness in yourself and, uh, and the other, um, well, it's, it's, it's really taking freedom um, in the truth, as truth, so, uh, and in relation to a certain truth, so, 
it's not evident in, in the effects and the consequences that it has over, over this um, uh, liberation from an, a, a logic of objects, whatever it is. It can be ideas too, and in a way. Mm -hmm. I made a couple of uh, disconnected points, I guess. Yeah, what is the, with um, compulsory public education being imposed in different contexts? The, uh, religious fusion into that, you know, went right into the late 70s, at least where I'm from, and I think it might be a little bit different. Uh, and then it was, uh, as, as religion was moved out of the public system, uh, what was imposed was a kind of um, moralism that had its antecedents in philosophy, in fact, some virtue and these types of things. So although the religion's been taking up, that piece is still there. Another piece that I think is important um, is um, the use of religion in colonialism to impose these types of orders. So residential schools where I'm from, where kids were taken away from mm. their cultures, and, and so certain types of moral codes were being put in. And, and thirdly, um, this sense of like the amount to which uh, we're um, repressed in a kind of social sense as human beings that we in fact impose these things onto other species even. So, you know, if you have a dog, for example, you have a dinner party, I have a dog where, you know, people hug when they come in and the dog will jump up and start humping somebody's leg or something and we say no. And, you know, it's supposed to be the sense of domination, it's how you train your dog. But the sense that, like, uh, we are imposing certain types of repression onto other species is, is also really wrong. But probably not really relevant to what we're talking about. <laughs> Okay, so... <laughs>